Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! I'm Liv, that woman you listen to who rants a lot but also tells you cool stories, or at least she likes to think they're cool. Well, friends, I'm so excited to share that I've reached 10,000 followers on Instagram and just in time for this, the 50th full length episode of the podcast. I'm pretty excited. It's super satisfying to have it just say 10K. And I won't lie, I feel pretty cool about it. As I told you all a few episodes back, too, this means that I will be holding a Q&A with you all, since so many of you wonderful people have asked me for exactly that and have generally asked me questions all the time that I just can't get to normally. So here's how it's going to work. This Thursday, the 25th of April, I will hold a live Instagram Q&A where I will answer your questions. In my story, I'll post one of those question boxes and you can all ask me whatever you want. I'll answer in the story that day, but I'll also be putting together certain questions that may be of a broader interest, and if there are enough, I'll record a bonus episode of the podcast where I answer those questions. This is where you not having Instagram comes in. If you don't have it, that's a-okay. You can send me an email, mythsbaby at gmail.com, or you can head over to my newly revamped website, mythsbaby.com, where on the contact page, you will find both my email address that I just told you, and a suggestion box where you can ask those questions. They can be whatever you want, myths questions, character questions, random questions about me, you do you guys. When it comes to the non-Instagram questions, they will go in that episode I mentioned earlier. So provided I get enough, there will be a whole bonus episode of me answering your questions. It's a bonus because if you don't want to listen to it, you don't care, that's totally fine too. You can just listen to the regular episodes. So send in your questions before Thursday so I can get them all answered on that day too because I don't have another day off for a long time, which is why it's happening on Thursday to begin with. So I do need to do the Instagram Q&A that day as well as any episode that I record. Extra fact, I live in Pacific time if you're wondering when Thursday is for me. As promised, along with this Q&A, I will be holding an Instagram contest where you can win a Myths Baby tote bag. I still have to figure out the logistics for that, so stay tuned on my Instagram page. One final piece of business before we get back into the brilliance that is the Odyssey. I am so psyched to announce that my incredible friend Matthew Dunleavy, the artist behind my beautiful podcast artwork, has created a new piece of merch for me. On my Threadless site, that's threadless.mythsbaby.com, you can now find a piece depicting Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite surrounded by the infamous golden apple of the Judgment of Paris, the incident that preceded the Trojan War and all the good crazy stuff. It's beautiful and in the same style as the Miss Baby logo. It's amazing. Go take a look and maybe purchase something if you're so inclined and looking for a way to support the podcast. And supporting the podcast is great because the MacBook I used to do all my writing on had just had its battery begin to explode, cracking in half my touchpad. I have other options, so don't worry about the status of the podcast itself. But still, my other options are not a permanent solution and a computer is crazy expensive, so you know. And with all that business out of the way, let's head back to Odysseus's journey after the end of the Trojan War. He's trying to get home, but the gods have other plans. This is episode 50. Winds are strong, giants are big, and a witch is a witch. The Odyssey, part four. Sing, muses of Odysseus's hubris and how he hopefully tempered it after being so stupid and endlessly taunting Polyphemus as if that wasn't going to come back to bite him. Odysseus has been traveling, He's been beaten, worn down, shipwrecked, basically every bad thing you can possibly imagine as you try to get home after a decade partaking in a pointless war. All of that has happened to old Odysseus, and he's not home yet, not by a long shot. Last we saw Odysseus, he and his crew encountered the Lotus Eaters and the Cyclops Polyphemus. Some of them were eaten. It was pretty gross and more than a little traumatic, I imagine. But they kept going, because what other option did they have? Odysseus and his men land next on the island of Aeolus. Aeolus is the keeper of the winds, king of his island Aeolia, 
the famed floating island. On this island, Diolis controls all the winds of the world. He can send them out or hold them back. He's their keeper in every sense of the word, given that gift by Zeus himself. The floating island of Aeolia is mostly cliffs, cliffs along which runs a wall of bronze, the type of showy architecture that only a god could get away with. And within those walls is his palace, his palace where he has twelve children, six boys, six girls, and of course with those numbers, Aeolus happily marries off each of his children to each other, which is just lovely, not at all weird. Odysseus arrives on the island and is welcomed by Aeolus. Wherever Odysseus lands, it seems, his stories are in high demand, except by Polyphemus, but that dude has some issues, so what can you really expect? Odysseus is welcomed by Aeolus, who wants stories of everything he's seen. What happened in Troy? How did the other ships hold up? The other men? Odysseus tells Aeolus all he wants to know, and he and the men remain there for a month. Finally, though, Odysseus convinces Aeolus he really does need to be getting on. He's been trying to get home for quite some time, and if he keeps staying everywhere for a month, then it's going to take even longer than it already has. So Aeolus sends him on his way. But he gives Odysseus a gift. Aeolus is the keeper of the winds, and he gives Odysseus a leather bag. Inside the bag are stored the fierce winds. Aeolus fastens the bag to Odysseus's ship with silver wire, ensuring no winds will escape. Then he sets Zephyr, the west wind, to blow the ship home to Ithaca. Odysseus finally has hope. This seems so promising. So many details suggest that this time, finally, they might actually reach home. Nine days pass. Nine days and it really does seem as though they'll reach home. Zephyr is blowing and Odysseus is steering and... What's that? In the distance, they can see Ithaca. There it is. Odysseus is thrilled, more excited than he's ever been before. They can see it. Home. Finally, they're so close they can see fires burning on the beaches. This is really it. He'll be home and he can see his wife Penelope and his son Telemachus and even his father Laertes. They're just so close. They're so close that Odysseus feels he can finally get a bit of rest. He's been steering all this time, worried that if he didn't, they wouldn't make it there or they wouldn't make it there as quickly as they could have. But now that he can see it, he can finally see Ithaca. He can rest just for a moment. But remember, Odysseus is telling this story to the Phaeacians after nine years being away from home. While Odysseus sleeps, his men discuss the bag he was given by Aeolus. What's in it? They wonder. Treasure, surely. Gold and silver, and who knows what else. They're jealous. Why does it seem that everyone loves Odysseus? He has treasure from Troy, and now treasure from Aeolus? We've been with him all this time. We've been through the same hardships. They complain to each other. Let's look in the bag, they decide. Let's see what he's been given. How much more treasure is he returning home with now? So they open the bag that Aeolus gave to Odysseus. And all hell breaks loose. All the winds rush out at once, and they're hit with the biggest, most destructive gust of wind they could ever imagine. And suddenly, they're rocketing off in the opposite direction of Ithaca. Ithaca that they could see just moments earlier. They're pushed far and fast, and Odysseus wakes up, sees what his men have done, and honestly wonders to himself whether he should just give up in this moment and jump off the ship and into the sea, ending this once and for all. But he doesn't. He powers through, laying low on the deck so he's not blown straight off the ship, and it's blown all the way back to Aeolus's floating island of Aeolia. They're back where they started. Once again, Odysseus goes to speak with Aeolus. He's in his palace, eating dinner with his wife and their children, who are, of course, all married to each other. Aeolus is confused. Why are you back already? He asks Odysseus. 
Hesitantly, Odysseus explains what happened and asks Aeolus to help them once more. But this time Aeolus can't bring himself to help Odysseus. Instead, he screams and shouts at him, How dare Odysseus return after what he's just done? How dare he ask for Aeolus' help when he's clearly so deeply hated by the gods? No, Aeolus won't help them. Odysseus and his men are forced to sail off from the island just as they arrived, with no earthly idea how to get home. Odysseus and his men row on. They row for six days, trying to compensate for the lack of winds they now have, thanks to the greed and jealousy of Odysseus's men, but also maybe he should have shared some of his treasure from Troy, but who am I to tell Odysseus what to do? They row on until they come to the town of Telepolis in Lystragonia. Remember, Odysseus and his men are traveling on multiple ships. It's not always clear because sometimes he's a little selfish in who he thinks of when he's telling his story to the Phaeacians. They land on Lystragonia, and all of the ships, aside from Odysseus's, moor in the harbor. It's a tight fit, and so Odysseus moors just outside. He fastens his ship to a rock outside the harbor. Odysseus sends a few men out to find the people of the area, since he isn't able to see any evidence of humans or livestock from where they've just moored the ship. The men go out, and they meet a girl who's traveling to get some water. She's the princess, the daughter of Antiphates, king of Lystragonia. The girl brings Odysseus' men to the palace, and when they go inside, they meet the queen, who's a fucking giant. The queen, the giant queen, then brings in her husband, and guess what? He's a giant too. Without hesitation, Antiphates, this king of the Lystragonians, an actual giant, grabs one of Odysseus' men as they stand before him and eats him. Before he can grab another, the other two men escape and find their way back to the ship. The king calls after them, his booming, giant voice traveling across his kingdom and summoning the other Lystragonians. All giants. They appear everywhere, picking up boulders and tossing them at Odysseus and his men. Now, if you hadn't already guessed, giants kind of have the upper hand here. The Lystragonians throw boulders at the men and at their ships, splintering them into pieces. As the men try to get away, they fall into the water when their ships are destroyed and the Lystragonians spear them like fish. But cunning, wily Odysseus has moored his ship, not in the harbor where the Lystragonians are throwing boulders and decimating ships and men. No, he moored just outside of it. And so while this is happening, Odysseus calls together the men from his ship and, realizing they have no way of saving the others, they get the fuck out of Dodge. So this one ship survives, making it the last of the ships that set sail with Odysseus from Troy those many moons ago. Odysseus and his men sail on, mourning their friends and wondering why the hell the Lystragonians were giants, until, yes, it's time. Odysseus's ship lands of the island of Aiaia, the island home of the witch Circe. Circe is the daughter of the titan god of the sun, Helios. The Helios who drives his chariot across the sky throughout the day, bringing the sun to the whole of the world. Helios who sided with the gods during the Titanomachy, saving himself perpetual punishment like so many of his siblings. Circe is the daughter of Helios and the Oceanid Percy. She is the sister of Aetes, Pasiphae, Perses, all witches, though Circe is the most famous. And so Odysseus and his remaining men land on Circe's island, and some magic they don't yet understand brings them into the harbor and safely moors their last ship. Here, I must remind you again, they were being told this story from the future. Odysseus is regaling the Phaeacians with how he arrived there after so many years. He's telling the story with hindsight 
of knowing that this is Cersei's island. In this moment, though, they don't know where they are or who awaits them. The men lay on the shore for two days, unable to do anything more than that. They're exhausted and they're in shock and they're mourning so many of their men they just watched die at the hands of the giant Lystragonians. Finally, on the third morning, Odysseus ventures out. He travels from the ship up a hill, trying to find a better vantage point, all the while searching for humans, listening for voices. Finally, he sees it, smoke billowing up from Circe's palace, though he doesn't know that's what it's from. From where he stands, he can only see smoke. Odysseus assumes that means there are people there, someone who could create a fire for food or heat. But who's to say who it could be? Or what? Should he travel down now that he spotted the smoke? Odysseus wonders to himself. In the end, he decides no. Who knows what it is? No, for now, he'll go back to his ship, feed his men a nice meal, and then set out once more to scout. On his way back to the ship, he spots a stag. He hunts it and carries the animal back to the ship, much to the thrill of the men on his return. The men eat and drink, and for that one day, forget that they have so, so many troubles. In the morning, Odysseus reminds them that they have so, so many troubles. (laughs) They need to find their bearings, he tells them. They don't know where in the world they are, what direction they're pointing in, what direction home is. It's not entirely explained, but it seems something about their recent plights have led them to a place where they can't use anything natural to determine where they are or where they need to be. They aren't able to determine where the sun rises or where it sets. Nothing. To put it bluntly, they're screwed, and they need some guidance in whatever way they can find it. So, he tells them... He knows now that they are indeed on an island, surrounded by the sea on all sides, and that there is lower land in the middle where he saw smoke rising. But this isn't comforting to the men. They all remember what happened when they landed on Lystragonia and how that turned out for them, and they remember when they landed on another piece of land and found only Polyphemus. They all remember a lot of their friends being eaten, like a lot of their friends. And they're not wrong. They haven't had the best luck when landing on random pieces of land. Seriously, so many monsters and giants eating them. But Odysseus pushes on. There isn't another option here. They have to risk it. So he splits them into two groups, has them put on their armor, and determines that he'll lead one group, and a man named Eurylochus will lead another. They shake lots in a helmet, and Eurylochus's group is the unlucky one that will go in search of life on the island. Eurylochus and his 22 men head out in search of life. They travel to where Odysseus told them he'd seen smoke rising through the trees. And there they find Circe's palace. It's tall, built of stone, set on a high foundation. It's impressive in itself. But add to that, there are wolves and lions prowling the grounds. And you've got something else entirely. The animals greet the men like dogs, friendly and nuzzling. Odysseus describes them as having been drugged by Circe to be her docile pets. Even though the animals are friendly and, I'm sure, incredibly cute, the men are terrified. Fine, they're being approached by lions and wolves, so maybe it'd be a hint intimidating, but still, cute! They stand still, trying not to startle the animals, and they can hear singing from within. It's Circe. She sings as she weaves. Polites, one of the men, suggests to the others that they call out to this woman they can hear singing. Maybe she's a woman, he says, or a goddess. So they do. They call out to this mysterious woman that they don't know is Circe, as they hear her inside singing as she weaves. And she comes out to greet them, inviting them into her home. All the men but Eurylochus enter the home. They're tired and trusting, but he suspects something is going on. The men enter, and Circe plays the hostess. She offers them food and drink, and they eat and drink happily. They trust her. She's just a woman, after all. What could she do to them? But Circe had added drugs to what she'd given them. Potent drugs that caused them to forget everything. Where they came from, where they're going, and then... Well, then she hits them with her magic wand. Because she's awesome, and she has a magic wand. She hits them with her magic wand, and in an instant... They're pigs. 
the men are transformed into pigs and brought to the pigsty out in the yard. They're pigs, but they're pigs who retain the minds of the men they were just moments ago. The pig men squeal, and Circe feeds them pig food. But Eurylochus stays outside. He knows something's up. He runs back to the ship to tell Odysseus all he's just seen, all about the woman who was singing and weaving and how she invited the men in and gave them food and wine and then how they all just disappeared. What he doesn't know, and what he doesn't tell Odysseus, is that they're fucking pigs, literally. Seriously, the things these men have seen, and we haven't even been to the underworld yet. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So Eurylochus tells his story to Odysseus, who immediately jumps into action, even though internally I'm sure he's fucking infuriated. Like, remember when they were basically home and he went to sleep for three seconds and everyone fucked it up and now here they are fucking it up again? Anyway, I don't know, but that's definitely how I'd feel if I were in his position. I mean, what the fuck, my dudes? Odysseus jumps into action, asking Eurylochus to bring him to where the men disappeared, But Eurylochus is a bit traumatized, and boy does he not want to do that. He begs Odysseus not to make him go back, saying that the men won't return and Odysseus won't return if he goes either. The dude is a bit worked up. Odysseus is understanding, though, and he doesn't make Eurylochus show him the way. But he does insist he's going to find the men anyway. So he makes his way on his own, heading towards where he'd seen the fire in the first place. Before Odysseus can reach Circe's palace, he stopped in his tracks by Hermes. Yes, the mischievous messenger god himself stops Odysseus en route to the palace in search of his men. Hermes stops him, asking Odysseus what he's doing there, and why on earth is he alone? Hermes tells Odysseus that this is Circe's home, and that she's already transformed his men into pigs and crammed them into pens. Do you think you can set them free? Hermes asks Odysseus. You can't. And if you try, he tells him, you won't ever make it home at all. You'll stay here with them. But Hermes continues, I can help. He hands Odysseus an herb, telling him it's an antidote to Circe's magic. She will try to poison you, he tells Odysseus, but her magic won't work when you're carrying this. Then, when she tries to hit you over the head with her magic wand, draw your sword and act as though you're going to kill her. She'll be afraid at this, Hermes tells Odysseus, and her response will be to ask you to have sex with her. Yes, I said it. Which has got to get it. She'll ask you to have sex with her, and you must go along with it, because she's a goddess. Once you fuck, Hermes says, though not in those words, you'll free your friends and yourself. Basically, it appears that here, Hermes is describing a woman who could really use a little relief, and once she has it, she won't really care enough to hold people hostage anymore. Female sexuality, am I right? But Hermes clarifies, you do need to make her swear an oath that she won't plan to hurt you further, otherwise you might find yourself missing an important mm, appendage once you're naked with her. Oh, Hermes. Oh, Circe. Oh, this story. Utter madness. It's amazing. So Hermes has instructed Odysseus on how to placate Circe and to free himself and his men. But before the messenger god leaves him, he pulls a plant from the ground at their feet. Showing it to Odysseus, Hermes points out that the root is black and the flower is white. This is Molly, Hermes tells Odysseus. It's tricky for humans to pick it, but the gods have no problem. And with that somewhat cryptic piece of information, Hermes is off, back to Olympus, and Odysseus makes his way into the home of the witch, Circe. Oh, thank you all for listening to this 50th full-length episode. 
Thank you so much for listening for however long you have been. To those of you who've been with me from the beginning, a big giant hug from me on this, again, the 50th full length episode. I'm so thrilled I've been able to do this for this long, so thrilled it's grown to what it is, and so thrilled you all followed me on Instagram so that I could get 10k followers because I'm a millennial, and man, does that provide some kind of insane, weird self-fulfillment. Way more than it should, but what can you do? So, Thank you. Thank you. And please, if you're so inclined, partake in this q and I'll be doing on Thursday. I've been asked by lots of you to do this, and I still can't quite wrap my head around the idea that you want to hear about me, but you seem to. So shoot. Ask me about me. Ask me about mythology. Ask me about that character you desperately want me to do an episode on, but I seem to keep not doing it. Ask me about whatever the fuck you want. I'm at your disposal. If you send in a message and you want me to reference your name or handle or whatever, just make sure you include it. And please, as usual, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. We have an amazing group of listeners here, but it would be so cool to share these beautiful nerdy things and insane stories with even more people, and your ratings, reviews, and subscriptions help to do just that. Okay, that's it. You're the best. I love you. Next week... A mini myth devoted to our favorite witchy woman, Cersei, and her family, and of course, Madeline Miller's book. I'm Liv, and I love this shit. <laughs>